I know why I didn't pass part three of my exams, because I didn't work hard enough. I know why I didn't pass A-level maths, because I wasn't clever enough. It's that easy. But I don't know what I've done wrong here. And it's such an important part of your life. Such an important part of your life. This is my mum and dad in 1964, in about 10 years, and like a million married couples, they'd separate and divorce. This is Chatterton Park Road in Oldham, near Manchester. I was born at home, just around the corner. It seems different to how I remember it, but memory's funny like that. She, she was in the year above, above me. Um, I don't know where you exactly got together, but you do, don't you, as kids, you know, tell your friend I like her or vice versa. Um, but yeah, that's, um, that's where we met, yeah, yeah. So she was in the year above me, so that we, there wasn't a direct year-on-year contact. I was in the year beneath him at school, you know, he was a year ahead of me at school. And uh, I don't know, I think I think he he asked, I think, Harry said he asked him about asking me to go out, but I mean, I was flattered because it was somebody in the, a year ahead, you know. You know, you kind of are at that age. Well, I mean, we're much more innocent in our day than they are now. No, no, she, um, she was a year older than me and hence was in the year, you know, ahead of me. I think, I'm not sure if we are 15. I think, we, I, I have it in my mind we were 15 when we first started to go out, heading up for 16. Memory doesn't always serve us too well, which is strange when you think about it. Most of what you feel, know, and love is based on memories. But we forget some things and remember others. You read of other families and one thing, who basically the, the divorce happens and then, you know, it settles down and, and maybe it, it sort of becomes amicable, whereas obviously this never, never did. We've been married 35 years and it's never gone away somehow. Um, I think because it was such a, um, a bitter sort of divorce and and the times afterwards and, and such a lot was said that it, it's gone so deep it's just affected everybody who's been involved and, and affected them very deeply sort of you know there was there was always um, conflict kind of thing one way and another the 
the family's totally been fractured, hasn't it, in every direction. And I think it is a shame that, that we don't see a lot of each other. Like I say, we, when you look back, we were a real sort of quite a tight unit considering everything that was going on. So it's it's just such a shame that it's sort of gone the other way, isn't it, as we've sort of grown up. This awkward-looking photograph was taken at Minana's wake. That's me on the left, with my sister and brothers. Although we've seen each other individually and at different times, we worked out that it was around 30 years since we were all in the same room together. We're talking about events that are well in the past now, you know, but they're, they're still current in the sense that they're still contaminating all of the, the relationships today. What I mean by that is that I think what people have done is made a taboo subject out of, out of it. No one wants to talk about it. It's, they're still, I think there's still raw nerves and sore subjects. And, and I don't think people want to revisit them. I think people have, have achieved some semblance of just getting by without constantly referring to it. But in doing that, we've just made it a taboo. We've just made everything a taboo. There's really nothing special about my family. Nobody became a world champion, but none of us turned out to be junkies or psychopaths either. We've all made our own way in life. I had doubts about making a film about family. I still do. I mean, it's not going to win me any friends, and perhaps it's better to leave the past in the past. But things haven't turned out brilliantly. I thought, Maybe this film was the only positive thing I could make of a bad situation. This is the M5 motorway, northbound. I'm driving home from Devon. In 1984, my mum, stepdad Harold, and three brothers moved to Devon to open a small hotel. It was a long way away, but I stayed in Oldham with my dad, stepmom Frieda, and sister Libby. For this visit, I'd driven down to get some interviews on tape. My stepdad Harold and two of my brothers, Damien and Jimmy. As it turned out, only Damien agreed to talk. But the visit was important for another reason. Because travelling home with me, in the boot of the car, were all the old family photos from my mum and Harold's side. A few weeks later, I picked up the photos from my dad and Frieda's side and started scanning. I found this message on the back of one of the photos. My sister Libby's on the front with a teddy bear. She wrote the message when she was just nine. She's the eldest. It's a beautiful photograph. But she didn't want to be identified in this film. There are lots of old photos of Libby looking happy. At school, on holiday, at home. That's me on the left, by the way, my older brother Richard on the right. Libby's six years older than me. That's a big difference when you're little. But despite the age gap, we got on pretty well. The thing is, none of these photos are easy for Libby to look at. And I understand that. Because although she looks happy, it's not at all how I remember it. I remember her more like this, with her eyes down, 
and no one really paying any attention. Libby was desperately unhappy, and I felt like the only one who noticed. It made life horrible for her at Mum and Harold's, like she was an unwanted guest. Libby's relationship with Harold was always difficult. He'd blow up at the slightest thing. And I always knew when she was sad. I suppose it was a kind of empathy. Things were better at my dad and Frida's. But we only spent every other weekend there and half the school holidays. I don't think I'll ever know or fully appreciate what these photos mean for Libby. I did ask if she wanted to be interviewed. But things are a bit awkward and we don't see much of each other. It's kind of sad, really. Granville Street. Next to Ogden Street, next to Brook Street, next to X Street, next to Y Street. Two up, two downs, back to backs, outside toilets. Some places with shared toilets. Cobbled streets. The end of the old era, you might say. Um, the milkman still came in a horse-drawn cart and the milk came out of a milk churn. Um, and you collected it in a jug. Harry was a favourite. Maybe that's because he was a boy and mothers and sons, you know how it is. I've always been the pain in the butt, the the, the one that was the difficult one and, um, you know, gave her the most trouble. My dad used to stick up for me and my mum used to stick up for Harry, you know, kind of thing. I am a, a great supporter of the 11 plus in principle just think about it we talk now about underprivileged families and you know provide them with opportunities that's exactly what it did for people like me out there because i was the only lad in our street who went to, to grammar school i wanted to be a vet that was what my ambition all through my childhood was to be a vet i always wanted to be a vet um my grandmother said to me my grandma wise when she said to me are you too too small, you know, to be a vet. You, you know, these big animals, how will you cope with them? And then I thought, oh, well, maybe I'm not clever enough anyway to be a vet. When I was at junior school at Eustace Street, um, the only preparation they did was to say you can buy these books from Barsley's bookstall and, um, and hold them to help you to prepare for the exam. And I think there was general knowledge and science and whatever other subjects there were. But my dad could either only afford or was only prepared to buy two of the three books. So there was no grey tiller blue, it was just something that I turned up and did. I was never brought up to imagine that there was a class difference. I've never been a person who felt there was a difference. And uh, But I think your dad has. And that has affected him in the way because he was ambitious to get to do better, to get out of that situation. And he, I mean, I understand that. Well, I, I will remember clearly one Sunday walking with my dad along Park Road and, you know, I was looking at the houses. Um, and when I said looking at the houses, your jaw wasn't dropping. But you think, mm, they're... These are nicer than the houses where I live. The, the gardens, the gardens, you know. Um, you had to walk a long way from Granville Street before you found a garden. I never even thought about it. That's where I lived. It didn't affect me in that same way. But then, as I say, I'd been lucky in the upbringing I'd had, so it didn't... I suppose it affects people differently, doesn't it? So... We were going out, I don't know, 15, 16, something like that. Um, I carried on to sixth form. She went to um, to work. I didn't go to sixth form because your granddad said to me something about, oh, he said, you don't need uh, A-levels to wash up. And I was going out with your dad at the time and I thought, oh, maybe he's right and that sort of thing. It's a weird thing, isn't it, that? So I went down to London, engaged, uh, and then came back regularly every other weekend, whatever it was. 
it was great. I used to come up every now and again and on the bus overnight and I used to go and meet him in Manchester in the early hours of the morning on on the bus and we used to go and have a, a coffee in a in a the you know, cafe that was open with all the tramps. <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, I mean he dad for me, he was like the love of my life I always felt then, you know. He was something else. The bride's dress was lovely, she looked lovely on the day, the, the bridesmaids. The meal was up at Park, uh, on, you know, Rippenden Road, you know, a nice place, etc, etc. Yeah, you know, you couldn't look back and say, it was, it was, back of a fag back here, it was cheap, it's rustled up. No, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was nice. This is my older brother Richard and me. There's no getting away from it. We're definitely brothers. And God knows why, but we were often bought the same clothes. But despite the resemblance and the physical similarities, really, we're total opposites. We get by, but we'll never be best mates. He's more competitive than me. He hates to lose. I mean, we'd agree to play a board game or something, just the two of us, and he'd cheat. I never understood why. He loved to tease and antagonize. He still does. Anything to get a reaction. I think I bugged him somehow. This is a good one. I think someone dared him to play chicken with the sea. And fair enough, he's stood his ground. And here's another. Richard said he could eat the whole cake, so mum dared him to try. Yep, that's our Richard. And he was a pain in the ass. And he always managed to pull a face on photographs. Richard and Libby never got on. She was a girl for a start, but bigger and older. For Libby, well, I think he was just a nuisance. His relationship with Harold was mixed. He got closer than I did. They loved a joke at my expense. They were like mates sometimes, but then they'd have a massive fallout. After one, Richard had to stay in his room for about two weeks, but he wouldn't back down. We got used to living with funny atmospheres. I can't say I understand Richard, but he did a great job training our dog, Toby, getting up early every day to walk him. Toby was cool. I haven't lived with Richard since I was 13. That's when I left to live with my dad and Frida. He stayed with my mum and Harold and moved down to Devon. But they chucked him out when he was 17. We only see each other every now and again. And I think we're both fine with that. I feel like I'm coming up against the taboo. I, I emailed my brother, Richard, who lives in China, and I asked him if he wanted to be interviewed or would mind being interviewed. And he replied to say no. He had no desire to speak to an audience of strangers. Um, he's not interested in the subject. Um, 
and so he, he just you know politely declined and I'm sad that I can't get him on tape and I'm sad that I can't get his views into this film but he said no and that's that's fine but then a few days after that I contacted my stepdad Harold now Harold is someone who I've spoken to most about this I've met him on two different occasions and talked about what the project is and what I'm trying to do and you know I thought I'd convinced him that this wasn't a, an aggressive or investigative project but he said no as well You turn up for work one morning, uh, you go in, reach through the door, and there's um, a new memory staff, uh, a woman, some race to myself, and I sort of took a liking to her. He got this little letter, this letter from this woman at work, and it was very affectionately written. And on the bottom, it had love Margaret and a couple of kisses. And I thought it was odd. That um, created a bit of falling out and that sort of thing, because doubtless um, these things show in your, your attitude. But I felt that something was going on and I felt unable to uh, compete because I was pregnant. Sorry. I wasn't going out and out looking for anything like this. This just happened. Um, and Yeah, I liked her, she liked me, blah, blah, blah. We didn't sort of do anything. Um, and you probably take that sort of thing home with you, whether you realise it or not, etc., etc. There'd be a row. And I could never quite understand why, how it had happened. And he'd, he'd go out. And he'd go off in the car and he wouldn't come back until after midnight. And that was so unlike him. You fall out or you're impatient or oh, I'm not, I'm in bloody this, etc. And it manifests itself in that way. And you probably become a person you weren't before. You know, you well, what's wrong with you? You know, you're quiet or something like that. He and Harold were going out. They told us, Anne and I, that we, he was going, they were going to a football match and then they were going for a meal afterwards. Anyway, Harold couldn't tell a lie to Anne and he admitted that they'd actually gone to the works do. And, of course, Margaret was at the works do, you see, and I hadn't been asked to go to the works do. And he'd lied to me. And I think that was a big turning point for me. I thought the um, important thing wasn't the fact that it happened, because that's a statement to fact. It was sort of how you tried to conduct yourself and be behave in that situation. Um, given the fact we're all human beings, you try and handle it as best you can because, you know, you, you don't want to hurt people, etc., etc. I mean, as far as I know, he's telling the truth, and I, and I can imagine that... He, he is, I'm not saying he's a liar or anything like that, but he said they never actually had physical intercourse, right. But does that make it less of an affair? Whether I'd undermined the marriage in her own eyes, that's, that would be sort of her choice. All I uh, can say is that um, there was nothing ever physical between us. We didn't go out on dates. Um, it was at work. Um, 
and by the time you know um, you came along, I'd, I'd changed jobs. It had run its course. It, it, it was it was past and gone. So this is me, but they aren't my fish. I didn't catch anything that day. As far as I remember, I've only ever caught one fish in my whole life. But then, I don't often go fishing. I didn't really look like this as a kid. My mum found an old hat and put it on me. She told me to look full on for a photo. I had to guess what it meant. I probably look more like this, kind of skinny and quiet. Not the best at joining in. I don't know whether I was unhappy with Mum and Harold, but I don't think it was the best place for me. I was known as the daydreamer of the bunch. It became a running family joke that I was a bit slow, but it wasn't very funny. We did have some good times, but there always seemed to be tensions. And I always felt wary of Harold. He could be loud and intimidating. I suppose he just wasn't my kind of dad. I always felt more comfortable with my dad. I thought he was the bee's knees. And I hated saying goodbye to him at the end of our weekends. Absolutely dreaded it. It was tough when he went to work in Saudi Arabia. Pre-email, pre-webcam, pre-easy and affordable international calls. He came home every few months and we visited there once. But other than that, all we had was airmail letters. He came home after three years and asked if I might prefer to live with him. I was definitely happier at my dad's, but it meant a whole heap of trouble. One night, I had to stand in front of my mum and dad and tell them who I wanted to live with. It was a clear choice for me, but not so easy to say it. But I did it. Libby had already left by then, but I don't know what it was like for the others when I'd gone. And I don't know what it was like for my mum. But on the day they moved to Devon, my mum dropped me off at school in the morning. And my stepmom Frida picked me up that night. And that was the end of that. That life. That routine. And the end of living with those people as part of that family. And I don't know if it sounds strange. But I was glad to go. I was becoming more and more unhappy with the situation. and Things weren't good between us. And... Uh, I started to think that how could I manage with just Richard and Libby and me on my own and I was thinking about I'd have to get a job. And then I found out I was pregnant with you. And I know it sounds odd and everybody laughs when I say it, but I know how all the other four children were conceived or what happened, you know, to cause it. But I do not know how I came to be pregnant with you. You as a third child were not planned. Um, I was going to say you were not wanted. Um, your, your mother said in the subsequent sort of divorce and affidavit, she regarded as a third child as an additional tie to me, which she didn't want. You carry on in the circumstances. You know, you go with things and 
Yeah, and your dad achieved his ambition to live on Chatter's Back Road, which he wanted to do, and you go along with it, but there's a part of you knows that it's not right for you anymore, you know? It was, I thought, easier, more convenient. I take the responsibility uh, without sounding like uh, a great white uh, hope. Um, to have the vasectomy, and that's what, what we did. Um, and of course, the significant thing about the vasectomy, it certainly then was, and they made this clear to you in no certain terms, this is irreversible. You have the vasectomy, that's it, there's no way back. I mean, Harold was a friend. He was a friend and he came to help your dad do the alterations that we wanted to do to the house, put built-in wardrobes and all this business. And uh, he came and he was doing that. You know, I went drinking with with home, Tanya with mum and dad. Um, we went to Wembley together, you know, that sort of thing. We were mates, best mates, etc., etc. Harold, one day, as I walked past him, he tapped my bum, like, you know. And it was like somebody had kind of lit a fire under some dry wood. Just as we said before, you pick up vibes and that sort of thing. I was now picking up vibes. Um, and there was one night, for example, where we'd been working um, onto myself and then we stopped and finished for the night and had a cup of tea, etc. And it was just the three of us, your, your mother, myself and, and Hunt. And I fell asleep because we'd been working side of thing. And, uh, and as I came round from the sleep, there were on the settee, and they were kissing. Um, so I, I, I you, you do remember something quite clearly, don't you? Um, I made it obvious I was coming round, so they split up. And um, so I, I it confirmed all, you know, like I say, you pick up vibes and all that. And then they left that night, and I said to your mother, I said, I wasn't asleep, you know. I, and then she said, oh, nothing in it, blah, 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 as they do. Um, and, you know, I, I I loved your mother at the time, unashamedly I say that, I loved her at the time, I did not want anything like this. Um, I wanted to believe her and naively, call you what you will, I, I genuinely, I sort of accepted it. But I knew, I knew. I used to try to put your dad off asking him to come round because I thought, you know, but it almost seemed like your dad, and I, it's ridiculous because he couldn't have been thinking like that, but it almost seemed like he knew and he was pushing it because he would say, oh, you know, I said, oh, he's been away, hasn't he? You know, he won't want to come round and that, yeah. And he'd say, oh, he will. And he'd ring him up and say, come round and you come round. And, you know, and it was almost, it sounds stupid. It does sound stupid. But it was almost like that. And I couldn't. And, of course, the worst thing was for us to be together, you know, like, and I was... But it was it was like somebody was filling the void of this emotional blank I'd gone into with your dad. It was never the idea of this film to blame anyone, accuse people or point the finger. I'm not interested in that. People do things, people make mistakes. Sometimes for the right reasons and sometimes not. I understand that. But these mistakes take on extra gravity when you've got kids. It's an immense responsibility. Like that Larkin poem almost says, they screw you up, your mum and dad. 
I don't want to criticise anyone. But on the other hand, no one's beyond criticism. In some ways, they really mess things up. But my mum's my mum, and my dad's my dad. They can separate, divorce, and learn to hate each other. But I can't. I'm part him, and I'm part her for life. And there's nothing to change that. And even if you could say they were the worst parents in the world, who wants to think that? Of their own mum and dad. He'd been away and he came back and that week when he came back we went through all the three of us sort of thing and I know they were off in front of me talking and I am convinced, and I could be wrong, that by that time she was pregnant and she knew she was pregnant and they were talking about it because on the following Friday night uh, when it came up that's when, yeah, she left um, I'm going on going out. He'd come round to do some work. He'd been doing some work. And uh, it was like a just a kind of, I can't do this anymore, sort of. So out of that, he said, right, well, I'll pick you up on Friday. Or you said oh, no, we went that night. Oh, I see, right, right. So that wasn't planned, planned so much. No. It was just on that day, I can't do this. I was surprised to hear that leaving us hadn't been planned. I felt fairly sure that she knew she was pregnant with Damien. I found it hard to believe that that wasn't the catalyst for leaving. So, looking back, were you pregnant with Damien at that time? I probably was, yes. But wasn't aware. My mum phoned a few days later. She wanted to say that she did know she was pregnant before leaving. I'm not sure they didn't go off together. I'm not sure he wasn't there on that Friday night and they didn't go off together. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I couldn't stand up in the court to law, so that's what happened, but I think he was, he was there and that's, that's what it is. So no, it wasn't... Um, I don't know that he was waiting around the corner and not, I can't remember the actual logistics. So I went upstairs and packed a few things in the bag and I came down and I said to your dad, I, Graham, like, I'm leaving with Harold. And he turned round and he said to me, Oh, OK, bye. And that was it. We were there, she said, I'm going. Because I, I, I said to her, I said, Are you all right for money? You know, if you're going, are you OK for money, sort of thing. In a weird way, kind of reinforced what I felt, that he didn't actually care whether I was there or not. It was a just a weird reaction. There was no, what? Can we talk about this? I, I, it was, I, I wasn't surprised. It was only confirmation of everything that I knew was sort of going on. We got in the car and drove up to Edinburgh and the next day, early, I phoned your nana and said, I explained what had happened. I said, could she please go round and make sure that you children were all right and that Graham was all right, you know, because I was worried, I mean, that you were all all right and I wanted to... I asked, can you help him with the children and stuff? Because I couldn't do anything. I didn't have anywhere to take you or to look after you, you know. You're in an absolute turmoil, a million and million things go through your mind, what comes on Monday when I go to work, you were two plus, I think you might still be in nappies, Richard was four, 
Um, all I can say to people is that imagine now this Saturday you've got you know three children like that you ask and you don't know where they are and to make matters worse to really you know smack you in the face she's gone off with your best mate but it, it was it was huge it was massive I felt maybe it was the wrong thing to take your children off your dad as well because you know, maybe I'd hurt him by leaving and that, you know, to take you kids off him would be another blow and, uh, you know, all kinds of thoughts like that were going through my head and you were better where you were, at least you didn't have a change of home, the stability would be good for you, you know, as it were. I'm not, I don't know now how I managed to do what I did with three kids. I had a job that took me away. Um, I was studying for my exams. Whatever happened, it, it went solely, totally, only through me. What was going on? I couldn't say to, well, well what can I do? Because it wasn't their decision, it wasn't their choice. It was, it was my problem. So that was the position I was in. And I felt very, very lonely. Very alone. This is my mum with my brother Damien. Around nine months after she left. Mum and Harold's first child. I suppose that makes him my half brother. But I don't really think of him like that. He's always just been Damien. He was an amazingly plucky little brother. Fearless, really. You could dare him to ride his bike off a cliff and he'd just go and do it, in style. Every now and again, he'd hurt himself and he'd remember he wasn't indestructible. But he was always good fun. He never felt down or got fed up. He was bright too, enthusiastic and good at drawing. He liked to play and he was always willing to have a go. And we still like to see each other as often as we can. There were some tensions though. I mean, he had a different dad for a start. I expect it's not easy to treat stepchildren the same as your own. I remember Damien's grandmother for that. Favoritism, I mean. I don't think she understood how it felt from our point of view. It led to a bit of resentment. It felt like he was a bit of a golden boy. I mean, it wasn't his fault. But it was a difficult situation, and we were just kids. Still, I feel bad for holding anything against him. But that's only part of what I remember. We were brothers. We grew up together. Played out. Shared interests. It wasn't all happy, and it wasn't all sad, but he was there throughout. And there was a time when I nearly forgot that. I was working at Reddish Print Works, the co-op, working for the works manager as his secretary. <laughs> I was dreadfully shy, you know, I, I, I really, I was. I, I, the first time I was taken around the factory, you know, the new girl, and they were all whistling and shouting. You know, it was, oh, I will never, never be able to walk around here on my own. <laughs> like I said, within a few short months, <laughs> I was volunteering. <laughs> 
your dad then came to work in a separate office, but there was always a slight air about him that I thought, oh, as I said, got a bob on himself, as the expression was. Um, but then, obviously, when he came to work upstairs and, and got to know him properly, then, you know, you just sort of click and appreciated his humour, etc., etc. So it felt right. I don't know, there was just something that, yeah, it was comfortable, it was right and easy, you know, sums it up, really. People had said his wife had left him, etc. I didn't know much about it uh, until he came to work upstairs um, and because I was, like I say, doing secretarial work for him, he then started to ask me to do private letters to his solicitor. So only then did I obviously start to know more about his situation. But yeah, I, I felt for the, for the kids being in the situation they were in when, when, when your dad described what it, what it was. Or you want to help, if you like, which sounds a bit grand, but... He, he was in the, my office one day and sort of walked across looking out of the window and said, so the kids think we should get married. <laughs> so that was the proposal. It wasn't down on bended knee. <laughs> and I, oh, uh, well, what? <laughs> Um, and then, you know, he just got into the, well, you know, it feels right, etc, etc. And almost, you know, what's to wait for? I, from going out for the first time in the November, you know, we were married in six months. I think my parents were a bit uh, shocked and, um, well, basically against it. You know, that your dad was looking for, I don't know, someone to look after the children, etc. Which was slightly hurtful to me. But, you know, once it was a fait accompli, then, in, in fairness, they realised that your dad wasn't that sort of person and completely accepted it. Didn't, didn't feel good in that respect, but I genuinely felt I knew what I was doing and it, was, it would work. It was a bit disastrous to start with because the taxi was supposed to take me, Ian and Carol, and the mum and dad, um, and the taxi didn't arrive. So Ian, who had a little Triumph Herald, was able to take me, my mum and dad, and there wasn't room for anybody else. So when we got to Jackson Row, we dashed in on the last minute, and in fact, our Ian was my bridesmaid. <laughs> so he signed the register for me, because, and Carol didn't see me get married. Neither did Pat, my friend. You were in at the deep end immediately, sort of thing. There were times when, you know, genuinely, yes, I thought, what have I done here? You know, I don't know that I can stay with this or, or, or whatever. Not an easy situation for anybody, you know, for me coming into it and three children having a stranger coming into into their life and home. Um, so, no, not, not easy. And when I, you know, I suppose everybody makes mistakes. And in, in that respect, I... I had no experience of children, um, so yeah, it was a hard time, it was a hard time, I think for all of us. The only thing really I remember from Elder Grove, which I suppose would be the earliest memory, is a Silver Jubilee. That's probably because my dad dressed up as a woman, which when you, what would it have been, three? It's quite a scary prospect, big bearded man in a dress, but um, yeah, so that's probably my, my earliest and strongest memory from Elder Grove. But I do, I do remember him working away a lot, yeah, and yeah, that was, it's quite hard really. But because I mean it was months on end, wasn't it? You know, which was you know quite tough really. But you know it was always nice when he come back because he always brought back weird and wonderful presents, didn't he? And but um, when you were a kid, he was this big bearded man, wasn't he? Like you say, massive, loud voice, very short temper, and that's how you sort of remember him. And then you sort of think about everything that that he took on as a sort of twenty. Eight-year-old, twenty-nine-year-old, you know, and he's he's there with three kids that aren't his, and suddenly one that is, and then another one that is. You know, he's looking after five kids as a sort of early thirties. It's it's a lot to take on, isn't it? 
and it just seems, yeah, I mean, it just seems strange full stop to think of my dad sort of being, you know, younger than, than me, really. All from, from day one with Blippi, right the way through to when they left, I was involved with the kids. I wasn't, I was the first of what I would claim to be the modern dad, as it were, you know, um, and again, you'd, you'd know this to be a pack of lies if, because since you were there, um, I've read to the kids at night, we played out and footy, um, <clears throat> we went for days out, you know, um, and I was involved. And, and that actually helped when she left because I sort of knew what to do. What I hadn't anticipated was what I consider to be your dad's extreme reaction afterwards with regard to you children. It, in my view, he, he used you as weapons. She didn't offer to pay any money. She actually got a job shortly after she left, so she had money coming in. But there was, she never offered one penny piece towards you, no offer of any help at all, up until the point where she was in a position where they got a house, etc. And then she wanted custody. Well, I decided long before then that I, was, I wanted the kids. Your dad wouldn't let me take you out. He, I used to have to visit you at the house. He used to take you in the bath and shut the bathroom door so that he, at the time that I came to see you, you were in the bath, so he wouldn't let me in, he wouldn't let me... He used to turn the light out in the room when I was in it. He, he was up to all kinds of things. Remember, I had the vasectomy. I couldn't have any kids. They weren't just the kids. They were. I, I enjoyed being a dad. I enjoyed that role. I, I, I didn't mind it at all. And that made me realise that I couldn't. We we could never work together to make sure your children were all right. And I needed to have custody of you, otherwise he would somehow exclude me from your lives. And I wasn't going to allow that to happen because I was, after all, your mum. And a uh, pretty poor mum, I suppose, but I was your mum, you know. I felt then, and I still feel now, that the decent thing to do was to say, I love you. You can't have been in my case. That's a decision you took for us as a family. I'd love the kids. I, you know, I'm the mother. I'd love the kids. I know some of that. But I've got my own. I've got another family coming on now. I will want to see my own kids, etc. But I won't try to take them off you. She didn't. It was almost like I was. It was a punishment I needed to take that everybody thought bad of me, you know? I wasn't thrilled at the idea of leaving your children and I wasn't, I didn't want to break a marriage up. So I stayed silent. That enabled, enabled in a way for your dad to be the innocent party. Um, and he, he believed his own publicity in the end. I, that's my, only my view. I contacted my mum and asked about the prospect of a second interview. She said, she said no, she said that the last interview had uh, put her in not a very happy place and it had taken her a few weeks to, to come back from it. I'm the one imposing a film. I'm the one pointing the camera at people and I don't have any right to feel entitled to that. But I haven't arrived at the right words to describe how I feel about my mum saying no. How do I represent my mum's side of the story? How, how can I be fair to her? She's the only source of that information. And I don't know, I wasn't there or old enough to be able to represent what she did. All of these things that people have 
packed away into boxes, these kind of tin boxes that have become dusty and rusty over the years, these cans of worms. The thing is they're still wriggling around, the worms are still wriggling around inside. You can't change anything about the past, but the present and the foreseeable future from my point of view is is poisoned by by all of this and you know I thought maybe people would like the chance to open these rusty boxes but actually they're not just proving difficult to prise the lids off it's it's proving difficult to get people to even talk about them I didn't exactly have a positive image of, of marriage, you know. I'd said right from the start I, I didn't want to get married. Things would go wrong. I just had this, this fear that things would just suddenly go wrong once we got married. Obviously we got married now for 15 years it took, but it's the best thing I've ever done, you know. But um, even growing up I, I just always used to every so often think in my mind, you know, if they got divorced, who would I go with sort of thing? And I did quite often have that. And I do remember my mum coming in on one occasion when we were at the hotel, and it was almost like she was kind of saying goodbye. It was almost like a final goodbye sort of thing. It was like she'd made her mind up to, to walk out. Um, you know, and she was sort of getting quite emotional and, and giving me and Jonathan hugs and that. And I, I just thought, well, this is it, you know, this is... This is the the moment I've been sort of dreading, you know, but here it is, and then nothing came of it. So whether they had a big argument and made up, they must have done, but it was just something that I always, I always expected to happen. You then come across officialdom where you're going to see the solicitor and eventually social workers and eventually the courts. First in Manchester, and then in Preston, and then in London. Um, none of which was, was, was a nice experience, you know. It's not something any of us have ever experienced before, being in a courtroom. And certainly London, in you know the Royal Courts of Justice, it's all quite imposing and overawing, really, you know. And they went to the lengths of, can Levy come to the court? Um, well, yeah, she can. So we, we we got Levy from from home that day, got her to Preston, got her back to the court, etc. And the judge spoke to her privately in her own chambers. And she said, I asked Levy what she wants to do, who she wants to stay with, and she wants to stay with her father. So the legal system had asked the question, got the answer, and ignored it. I was one out of four who really hadn't got anything to do with the situation. Um, so you do feel a bit aggrieved to be in a witness box and being questioned in a slightly hostile manner. We have given it our best shot. We've got our strongest arguments out today, including what the judge said. And I remember saying to Frida when we came away from Preston, we'll lose custody. Because it they didn't, wasn't finalised at Preston, we then had to go on to London sometime later. And I said to Frida, we'll lose custody. Libby, having always said she wanted to stay with her dad, suddenly changed you know, her mind and said, no, she wanted to go and live with her mum. Um, and your dad said, if that's what you want, then, you know, so be it. This social worker, I think, saw me with you kids once, but then writes a report which goes to the court and is read by the judge and is listened to. He wanted a screaming call. He said, this is not fair, this is not true. We, we didn't see necessarily why, if you'd wanted to stay, you and Richard had wanted to stay, uh, that you couldn't have done, but the court's ruling was that the three children should be kept together, you know, that that was the, the best way for the children. And it was a tremendous blow, obviously, for your dad. You know, if I say lesser so for me, obviously because you were not my children. For your dad, it was an absolutely horrendous blow. You felt let down on so many fronts, on, like I said, officially, legally, personally, and you almost don't know where to turn to. I wish I could have come out of that and say that 
the system, I think, treated me fairly. I, I deserved the end product. Then I think that would have been fairly easy or it would have been easier to live with. But in fact, the opposite was true. Driving back from London that night was on a, I think it was a January night. So a dark winter's night and he was absolutely in despair. So rotten time, really. You know, we, we got back and one thing and another, and basically that coming weekend, you, you went to your mum's. I mean, I can still remember packing your stuff and getting all your, your toys and everything together and your mum turning up bright and breezy on the doorstep, you know, on the Saturday morning. And, of course, you scampered off down the path, you know, all gleeful to the car and quick wave and off you went. Um, and then people, you come in and shut the front door. And... This is Jimmy, my youngest brother. He was born in 1977, Mum and Harold's second child. As I remember it, we all loved him to bits. He was just the most adorable little brother. I think he was probably the first baby I ever properly looked at. I couldn't believe how small his ears and little toenails were. Perhaps he was something, someone we could all share someone we all had in common. I don't have great memories of those days, but I only have fun memories of Jim. But nobody's all sweetness and light. He was his own person too. He was always full of ideas and thoughts. He always had something in his head, always going somewhere, with a mischievous glint in his eye. He loved nature and animals. He was like our little ecologist. He spent hours once cleaning dead leaves out of our little garden pond. He said he'd seen a sign that said, keep beautiful Britain tidy. An environmentalist, before it became popular. He was close to my mum. He became very attached to her feet. He'd sit on the floor next to them for hours. They were like his comfort blanket. But he could also take himself off to play. He was fine on his own. But we were a big family, and he loved being part of the gang. He thrived on it. He was definitely a part of the gang. But the sad thing is, one by one, and for various reasons, we all left him eventually. First Libby in 82, then me in 84, then Richard was chucked out in 86. And Damien left for university. And then even mum left eventually. Though not until years later. I very rarely see Jimmy now. He doesn't like to keep in touch. I tried to contact him for this film. He never returned my calls or answered any messages. Perhaps that's fair enough. He was just, a, he was the cutest kid when he had these big brown eyes and he was, uh, like I say, he was always up for anything. He was. You know, he was great, he was comical, he was, uh, he was real good fun to have around and uh, I remember, <laughs> I remember um, one time we <laughs> got him in a wash basket, <laughs> do you remember that? We got him in a wash basket at the top of the stairs and he was perfectly happy to do it, I mean that's what he was like, he was just absolutely up for anything. 
So we got him in this wash basket and pushed him off the top of the stairs, went tumbling down to the bottom and sort of got, ran down to the bottom to see if he was all right. And he's, it was almost like a thumbs up sort of thing. When it, <laughs> but that's what he's like. He'd, he would he would do anything. And uh, it was it was always great to have him, have him there just because he was always good for a laugh, wasn't he? But um, Jonathan's teachers contacted my parents, and he was covered in bruises. I felt terrible because it was kind of like, God, yeah, that is that is me. That's what you know. That's what I'm doing. And it was a little bit of a, a wake up call, you know, because that was just the way of things before that happened. Then when a third party gets involved and sort of says, you know, that this is out of order. He's like a bad child. You sort of think, yeah. That's that is terrible. Yeah, so I, I felt guilty. Felt really guilty for that, I must admit. But um No, 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 it was like a game, wasn't it, really? It was like who could get the best dead arm, you know, and like you'd sort of like get your knuckle like that, punch each other's arms and whoever's arm went dead the first lost, you know. It was uh it was like a game, it wasn't and I think I th I, th I think both sides saw it like that, whoever it was. And I think it probably did come from Richard. <laughs> yeah, he he was uh, pretty brutal at times, wasn't he, as an older brother. I, I, I look at it now, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad in a way, really, because I, th I think it sort of, <laughs> in some ways, toughened you up. I mean, I was always the best at my school at Scabby Queen and Slapsies and things like that, and I've got to put that down to Richard. <laughs> so... <laughs> so uh, but no, there was definitely this thing where, you know, Richard probably punched you, so you thought, I'll punch Damien, I'll punch Jonathan. And it was kind of, it kind of became, like, institutionalised into you that that's what you do. You just you just punch your younger brother. You know, if he annoys you, you punch him. And But, um, you know, we looked out for each other, didn't we? And we used to, you know, do stuff together all the time. We used to... Whether it was going out cycling or you know roller skating, skateboarding, because it was four lads together, it was always something to be doing, and and uh, I don't th I don't think we ever really fell out with each other, did we? You know, in a not in a big way. You might have little tiffs here and there, but you know we were always best of mates, really. In the time since losing custody, I don't think my dad ever wanted or expected us to reject my mum. But perhaps it would have helped him if we had. I wonder sometimes whether that was actually the acid test. An unconscious test of whose side we were on. But it's impossible to pass that kind of test. When you're a child of divorced parents, you become good at separating your life and dividing your loyalties. But you'll never be good enough. But I did try, and I suppose I still do. By the late 90s, there were some elements of a functioning family hub at Mum and Harold's. Only some, but they were better than nothing. But all that collapsed when Harold found out that Mum had been having an affair. They separated and divorced after that. Mum retired and moved to France in 2010. She lives there on her own, but she's learning French and she keeps herself busy. She sent me this cutting of her with a local retirement group. I wonder sometimes whether it's self-imposed exile. When my mum left my dad, he was very quiet for a long time. Very sort of um, introspective sort of thing. He was just, he'd be sat think, thinking about things. So you could see him sort of mulling things over. Um, you know, which is, we've never, never seen him like that at all. And it, you know, it's quite worrying really. But, um, yeah, he's he's like I say, totally changed man now. He's he's 
he seems really quite happy and contented with, with, his, with his life now, which is, yeah, a definite change. I've sort of been thinking to myself, has it been a terrible childhood? And I don't think it has. I think, you know, I think, well, certainly I had a, a good childhood. I'd like to think it, we all did, really, like, all in all. When you Obviously, there were bad points about it and bad times, but I think you always have that. But, you know, I th I'd like to think I had quite a, quite a good childhood and enjoyed the family environment and everything and enjoyed, you know, growing up. I'm trying not to be too bleak about it because there are lots of things that I have fond memories about, you know. I, I hope so. We, we were only talking the other day. I don't know what, how it came up about holidays and it's either an article in the paper about people talking about the childhood memories and we, we, your dad sort of said, we did have a lot of good times, didn't we? And I hope you think we did. I don't know if it's a coincidence, but none of my family live in Oldham anymore. We all moved away ages ago and scattered far and wide. Devon, Cheshire, Yorkshire, China, France, Germany. But it's strange to go back to Oldham once in a while. I don't know anyone, and no one knows me. And all those places I knew and lived in, they're kind of meaningless to me now. Just bricks and mortar. It's almost strange that those places still exist. Maybe you expect them to fade like the photographs. Or maybe you expect to feel something more sentimental than just recognising the place. But those houses and streets and schools are someone else's now. And that's how it's supposed to be. I remember once you said that it, it made you lose faith in human nature. Or... Yeah, yeah, very much so. Which, which unfortunately, I, I have to this today to an extent or another. Um, and whether that's sort of right or wrong, whether I sh you know, whether somebody say, oh, move on, draw the line, you know, get over it. Um, yeah, right, they, they, they can say that. But you are what you are, you know. He just felt it so deeply, the, um, the unfairness of it, that it, it stayed with him. It stayed with both of us, I suppose. It's so much. A, it's so much a part of your your life and what you are, almost what you, what you are and who you are now. You know that you you feel no that right or justice sort of doesn't always prevail. And that sounds a bit naive now, but it made us, I suppose, really quite bitter in in many respects. Your dad's certainly very bitter. The question that's been important to me all this time is. Who brought us into this minefield? That's, you know, I, I didn't want to be in that minefield any more than anybody else. Now, if I'd have turned into the minefield, then this is where I'd have said, oh, you know, Graham, you were. And that's where I think, no, I'm not saying we were, I, I didn't bring it to the edge of the minefield, or something, but I didn't actually take us into it. You just get so tired of it, don't you? You know, 35 years, I feel I could just walk away from it um, and all right you you have your little tantrum and, and upset and one thing another and then you you just get on with it again don't you sort of thing Freddie had to put up with so much it's been so difficult that if 20 years ago she had turned and said Graham I, I can't put up with this anymore I'm just I can't give anymore I couldn't have blamed her I couldn't not have blamed her can you see how things could get better? You no. know, could you say, is there, well, if something could just happen, everything would be all right? No. No, I, I don't think anything will change now. You know, everybody's entrenched in the, the views, you know, over all these years, and none of us are suddenly going to turn around and say, ah, I know what either went wrong or what the solution to this is. It's not going to happen. That 
is the, that is the sadness of it, the tragedy of it. And if I think I've damaged other people's lives because of it, whew, that's, that is an awful lot to come to terms with, which one never really does. I don't think we've ever recovered from what happened all those years ago. Kids are supposed to be innocent, but that doesn't really make any difference. Like a nuclear explosion, everyone and everything within range is affected. Everything's got a history and nothing's quiet as it seems. You deal with the fallout for the rest of your life. It doesn't just wash off. I rarely see or speak to Libby. I think that's the same for everyone. Richard lives in China, but visits once a year. I see Damien when I can, but he rarely sees Libby or Richard. Nobody sees Jimmy. I see Harold perhaps once or twice a year. I speak to my mum every couple of months, but I don't know when I'll see her again. I speak most to my dad and Frida, once a week on average. Things are okay, but I don't think any of us would turn down something better. But nobody's family's perfect. <laughs> 